Good morning. This is Susan Scalafani from the Forum for World Education. I just wanted to spend a two minutes introducing the forum for those of you who are not familiar. The Forum for World Education was established in 2018 to focus on transforming education for societies and their economies. That requires planning to prepare young people across the world for both the current and the future visions of work. Last December at our conference at OECD, more than 40 international leaders in education and business from 20 countries and five continents presented their vision for the future of education to an audience of over 400 people aged from 15 to 80 because we believe that the young people need to be involved in planning their future as well as are telling them that the future is theirs. Since the pandemic ended in-person conferences, we focused on webinars that bring together education and business leaders to discuss aspects of the challenge. First, the impact of COVID-19 on education worldwide, considering international examples of effective education practices that have been used, analyzing the future of the job market, as well as how we're going to finance the future of higher education. And today we're talking about analyzing the economic impact of learning losses and how to assess the losses from COVID-19. So we, as I turn it over to Andrea Schleicher, Education Director of OECD, and Rick Hanischak from Stanford University. I'd like to thank Andreas for his continued collaboration with the Forum for World Education. We greatly appreciate his assistance, his willingness to participate, and his assistance in planning our sessions. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Andreas. Thank you. I think someone still needs to enable my video. Okay, now it works. There you are. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me again. And I, we are very privileged also to have Professor Rick uh, Hanushik join us, a very prominent economist at Stanford University who has shaped the entire field of the economics of education like no one else I know. And I hope we can see him. There he is, yes. <laughs> and uh, Professor Hanishek has prepared a fascinating report on the economic impacts of the learning losses that have been incurred during the pandemic, which he's going to present uh, and discuss today. And he will answer any questions that you have, um, in which you can post in the chat throughout the session. And I can encourage you uh, to do so. Uh, in a way, you can say that uh, students belong to those who are least vulnerable to the coronavirus. That's the good news. But there's probably no group that has been more deeply affected by the public policy responses to this virus than young people. Now, at a global scale, 1.5 billion students have been locked out of their school, some since the beginning of this year, uh, and some have still not been able to go back to school. Uh, sure, for students who know how to learn, uh, who have had access to great digital resources, amazing support from instructors, tutors, parents, maybe this experience has been you know, quite interesting. But for the many students with, without access to those kinds of supportive ecosystems, the experience has been absolutely devastating. And not just because of the direct uh, loss of learning opportunity, but also because school is a very, very important uh, social place. Uh, fortunately, many education systems are on their way back. Schools in many countries have sort of learned to coexist with the virus and they have trained their staff to implement social distancing, health standards that make schools safe places, uh, I think we have seen that is possible. But even when schools are back, the learning losses that they have already incurred uh, throw very long shadows over the future of students and over the future of our countries. And that's exactly what Rick is gonna talk about. We need to better understand those long-term consequences. 
Now we are very conscious of the costs of keeping schools open. You know, you have one small health related incidence and the world is going to know about it. We are also sort of conscious of the short term cost of keeping schools closed. You know, the you know, parents, you know, have figured out this is actually, you know, impacting their life and their work in big ways. But actually, we pay very, very little attention to the damage that school closures have in the long run, you know, to individuals and, and nations. And that's not unusual. Public policy tends to prioritize the urgent over the important. Uh, but it's also because it's typically so difficult to assess what school closures might mean for the long run. So it's not just, you know, you know the, 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 the lack of interest in public policy. It's our lack of knowledge of what this really means. And that is where the work of Professor Hanushek is absolutely groundbreaking. He has developed methodologies to project the learning losses in today's schools to what that means to economic development in the long run. And uh, his numbers are big, you know, I can tell you that already now. You might, and you might be, you know, think, well, they are too big to be believed. No, but think of it the other way around. Everything you see around you is about people. No. The material value on which you do this Zoom call is just a few dollars. No. Everything else is the skills of people. No. People have put this together. That's what we pay for. And people is about knowledge and skills. No. So less knowledge means less productivity, less economic outcomes. And you add that simply up over many years and you arrive at very, very large numbers. And that's what we just need to be conscious of that these are cumulative processes. But uh, Professor Hanushek, tell us more about the reasoning behind your work and the methodology that underpins your work so that we can better understand the numbers that you have produced. So I pass you the floor. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you for that introduction. And you made the key point. We've lost a lot of learning for those who were closed out of schools. The numbers I uh, will present are in fact large. What we've learned since these numbers were produced in August is that they might be too small as things go on. So let me give you, let me share the numbers themselves and then we'll, um, uh, then we can discuss what they all mean. If I can. Um, the work I'm going to present here is some work that I've done with my colleague Ludger Woosman at the University of Munich. And they were done for the OECD with Andreas at Andreas's encouragement. Uh, we set out over the summer after we had seen the schools being closed to just put some economic value on the loss that we see. This is a report that is now available on the OECD website, or it can be found on my website. Um, and you can look at the details of what I'm going to present. In uh, uh, the beginning of 2020, um, almost all schools in the world closed uh, for varying amounts of time. Um, and people were most worried about how do we protect our children? Can we get them uh, any materials at home? But there was no real planning for that. And most of the attention over the spring uh, through this year, through the summer, focused on just how do we reopen schools? And it was more mostly on the logistics. And at this point, as we're into the beginning of the school year in many parts of the world, uh, we still don't know the full harm. We see that there are very different circumstances, as Andreas pointed out, in different countries of the world. I think the US is struggling to reopen, whereas Germany and China seem to be back into normal schooling now, whether they stay there is another matter uh, as the pandemic returns to some of these countries. What I'm gonna do is provide what I call the best uh, case estimates of the loss. The best case estimates are ones that uh, take into account the closures of schools in the beginning of 2020 
but they assume that at the beginning of the new school year now, everything reverts to the performance of the schools in 2019. In other words, we're all back as if nothing had happened now. <coughs> Excuse me, we, we know that that's not the case though. So the first thing to look at is what happened to the kids themselves. What I'm showing you here is some work in the background that motivates all of the analysis. The work su suggests that if you look around the world, the labor market pays for skills. Individuals get more money based upon the skills they have. Now it differs in some countries. For in Singapore, you get very large returns for learning. And then it goes on down through uh, Chile and Israel and the US. The US is pretty high. <clears throat> and then it goes down through the other countries. This takes data that we have from the OECD. The OECD um, a few years ago did what's sometimes been referred to as the adult PISA. They went out and uh, sampled a random sample of the population in each country and of workers throughout the entire life span of work. And they gave these workers tests that look like the PISA test or the other tests that we know from international tests where they uh, were tested in math and reading performance. It turns out that those tests are highly predictive of the returns that individuals can get in the labor market. Now, if we put that together with what, what we know about school closures and what we think was the learning loss for the spring, there are a variety of different estimates that we have. We know that schools closed uh, essentially in March, at least of uh, 2020 for the re remainder of the school year. Um, and there are different people who have provided estimates of how much learning or how much did students uh, miss in terms of what they were learning from that, those closures. We're gonna take what I call a modest estimate and that, um, that assumes basically uh, that a year uh, that <clears throat> over the spring, students lost the equivalent of a third of a school year. A third of a school year, according to the previous estimates of the impact on individuals for the average, the first column that says pooled, says that on average, kids around the world will lose 2.6% of their lifetime earnings. This is over their entire career because of the closures in the spring. The US, which was above average, will lose 3%. If you trailed uh, that line all the way out to Singapore, you would see that kids in Singapore of this cohort that was closed out of schools can expect to lose 5.6% of their lifetime earnings. That is if nothing else happens. This is presuming that schools go back to full-time study at the same pace that they were doing it uh, in 2019, but they, this is a permanent loss. Now we see that this is a permanent loss from a variety of different sources. Um, in different countries over time, uh, there have been long union strikes of schools that have closed schools. Uh, Germany had a somewhat strange adjustment of their school calendar in the back where they ended up with a couple cohorts that had shortened uh, school years. If you trace what happened to the kids that were involved in either the school closures uh, for strikes or the German closures, you can pick out those cohorts uh, out of all of the workers in these societies. Those cohorts have uh, suffered permanent losses and their earnings are less than you would expect for the cohorts either before or after them. So that this is a, uh, a reasonable estimate if nothing else happens. 
Now, these estimates are, uh, pertain to just the individuals. There's another way to view um, these losses, and that is just what Andrea said in the introduction. Nations depend upon the quality of their uh, society and their workforce. And what we found is that the growth of nations depends upon how much the people know. So this is a simple graph that comes from a more complicated study uh, that Rutger Woosman and I did in the past. Um, on the horizontal axis, it's con test scores, conditional test scores. Think of these as PISA scores. Uh, on the vertical axis is the long run growth rate, the growth rate that each of these countries saw between 1960 and 2000. So at the bottom left hand corner, you see South Africa and Peru and the Philippines that have low test scores and very low growth. And it goes up to the very top where you see that Singapore and Taiwan with their high test scores have also had high growth rates. Conditional just means that we adjust for the fact that uh, if you start behind, it's easier to grow fast. If you start behind, all you have to do is copy what everybody else does, and then uh, you can grow faster because that technology is already there. If you start out ahead, you have to actually invent new things, figure out how to change productivity of your existing plants and so forth, and that's harder. But once you take that into account, what you see is that countries are quite well aligned to the skills of their population. Now, what we're suggesting is that because of the school closures, the future labor force of all the countries that suffered these closures will be less. The future labor force will not be as skilled because they suffered this learning loss. Now, what does it mean for, in fact, the economy when we look at that. Well, here's the same picture. The first column says, well, let's look at different levels of potential learning loss, but let's look at the losing a third of a year equivalent of loss, which I, as I say, is an underestimate. What that suggests, according to the historical pattern of economic growth, is that these countries of the world, all those that closed, can expect to have one and a half percent lower GDP throughout the remainder of this century. That is the result of a lower quality labor force in terms of their learning that in fact exhibits less growth into the future. And this is in terms of the present value taking into account that some of that loss will be later in the century but it's one and a half percent lower um, is, as we see. Now, why is this a minimum? What this is, is a minimum is that it assumes that schools are back in order, which might not be bad for China. It might not be bad for Germany as long as they can avoid a second closure because of the return of the pandemic now. It's not very good for the US because the US um, has been having a very difficult time getting back to actual learning. There's been a lot of discussion of whether it's in class or hybrid and so forth, but it um, is a, certainly an underestimate. Secondly, other people have now developed more refined estimates of the learning loss that occurred because of the closures. We took the available data as of the summer, but the current estimates are in fact, quite a bit larger. You might say almost double that. So you can see that if it was a learning loss of two thirds of a year effectively, you could see 2.9% lower GDP for the every year into the future for the rest of the century. Now, what's that mean? Well, here's, here's just the estimates for G20 countries, and the first uh, column to the right of minus a third learning loss is what I've been looking at. If you look at China, according to its 2019 GDP of 
$6.5 trillion, they lost $15.5 trillion because of the school closures. If their school closures were the equivalent of a third of a year. South Africa is the lowest. It only loses uh, $500 billion, $504 billion US dollars uh, because of the closures, but that's only because its economy is the smallest of all of the G20 countries of the world. The US estimates are that um, optimistically, the US lost $14.2 trillion that's present value in terms of today's dollars. It's equivalent to how much would you have to put in a bank today to make up for that loss uh, to the labor force. If in fact, the more recent estimates that suggest that the losses could have been double that, you can look in the far right-hand column for each of the G20 countries from Argentina to the United States, and you see that um, uh, two thirds of a year of learning loss is equivalent to over $30 trillion for China and $28 trillion for the United States and other countries are in between, $3 trillion in Korea um, and so forth. So <clears throat> the simple story is these are big numbers and the main numbers that we have produced may in fact be underestimates. Now, the question is, what happens? Can we just make up? There are some people that uh, go around saying, well, if we just get schools back to where they were in 2019, we'll just quickly make up for that. But that's inconsistent with the way kids have been learning all along. And uh, by the best estimates we have, for example, the strikes or the uh, German school short years, um, that just returning to 2019 will not erase these losses. Those losses are permanent. Um, there's an, an added problem to all of this, and that is we're already facing reduced information about where schools are. Because of the school closures in many countries of the world, the normal testing of students just ended. And so we didn't get information on where they were. Now, some schools are beginning to test students as they return to school for a new school year, but we still don't even know where they are. And lots of school systems are arguing against continued normal testing uh, because it's an unusual year. But it's just because it's an unusual year that we can't avoid uh, testing students. Now, it's, it's not inevitable that this happens. If you look at, for example, the PISA data uh, since 2000, when PISA began testing students around the world, you do see countries that have made dramatic improvements in their performance. But it takes serious work, and uh, it's not going to happen by just assuming that business as usual will get us there. There are, um, I'll just mention quickly, some specific options. Um, there are a couple things that we've known all along about school policy that we haven't implemented very uh, reliably, at least not in the United States and many other countries. One is that it pays to employ teachers where they're most effective. So in the United States, where there's a lot of hybrid learning going on and a lot of in-home learning still going on this fall, um, we see that some teachers are just simply better at the video instruction and synchronous and asynchronous uh, instruction over video. These aren't necessarily the teachers, by the way, that are the best at in-class instruction. Um, these are different skills. And what we ought to be doing is what we should have been doing in the past, and that is using our most effective teachers more intensively. We should allow our best um, teachers at uh, internet learning and in-home learning do more of it. Secondly, um, something we've also known for a long time, and that is that 
um, we should individualize instruction more. One of the things we're going to see and are seeing, in fact, in classes around uh, the world is that students are coming back to school very with very different starting points. Just as Andrea said, some parents um, and some schools were able to deal with the closures better than others. And what that does is increase the variation in preparation for students starting the new school year. If we individualize instruction, as we probably should have been doing more of all, all the way along, we can think of dealing with students where they are and helping them out and doing better than we were in the past. So it's not inevitable, but it takes a lot of work. And so let me just stop there and uh, uh, go back to uh, discussion. Yes, thank you, Rick. And uh, while I encourage everyone to post questions in the Q&A or the chat box, let me start with one. You know, you presented uh, average uh, losses and the average impact, but clearly this pandemic and the school closures will not affect all students in the same way. They are most likely to hit the students in disadvantage uh, hardest. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any thoughts on you know, how the kind of learning losses might, or the, the lost income might be distributed? Oh, that, that's a very good question. Um, and in fact, everybody, in, particularly in, in the United States, much of the discussion is about exactly that issue. We know that um, some higher educated parents, some um, parents that are, have more flexibility in their time at home, help their kids a lot and we're able to help them with their learning during the closures. But we also know that some parents are not as prepared to help at all. And it usually corresponds a lot with their economic background. Um, and so what uh, everybody knows, and there's a little bit of evidence starting to come out, is that the gap between the higher uh, social economic status families and lower social economic status families is growing. In fact, there are some estimates that suggest that um, for disadvantaged kids, poor kids, um, the losses might have been those two thirds of a year learning losses that we talked about. All my, the main estimates were on a third of a year of le effective learning loss. But if we go to two thirds of a year, what we see is that um, uh, disadvantaged kids might be uh, losing five to 6% of their lifetime earnings as opposed to the 3% that I talked about. Yeah, and another perhaps more kind of challenging question is really like, um, you know, in this pandemic, we seem to be able to run supermarkets, you know, open cinemas, uh, you know, travel. And uh, it's sort of the school closures have been a pretty much unquestioned initial response. Now, uh, why is it that it seems so much easier to ignore the kind of impact of uh, learning needs and, and of, of students from disadvantaged backgrounds in particular than the kind of uh, immediate interests of adults? Oh, well. <laughs> um, that's a little bit of a mystery. Um, uh, frankly, it's been hard to get anybody to focus on the learning per se that's been lost. And uh, somehow the discussion throughout the media has turned entirely to the logistics of reopening, whether people all have an iPad or whether they have an internet connection or, or what's being done and, and the concerns about how the spacing in classrooms. Um, I think that that is starting to change. I know that in Germany, the discussion has moved from just reopening schools to learning and it, in a very big way. So that um, Chancellor Merkel has emphasized the importance of keeping schools open ahead of other uh, kinds of activities. That hasn't happened in the United States yet, frankly. Um, and the, um, media has focused all of its attention on just the, the small matters of how we've organized things 
as opposed to ensuring that these kids aren't hurt more than they already have been hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you know, even uh, the policy response in Germany, actually most of that is argued on the grounds of parental employment. You know, actually, I wonder to what extent that really is framed around the immediate learning needs of, of children. But, you know, uh, let's hope so. And uh, I, I do believe, I mean, many education systems are now on a good track to get back to schooling. But you made a very important point, namely that going back to the status quo will not erase those learning losses. It's really about uh, enhancing productivity in the learning. Uh, and you highlighted some of the avenues towards this, including, you know, um, you know, leveraging the expertise of great teachers and using digital technologies uh, uh, more thoughtfully. You think that this pandemic uh, could, you know, positively influence productivity in education in the long run? I, I think it's possible. I mean, it's, it's still a long shot because we've, some of these ideas are ones that we've had for a very long period about schools and we see that they're very slow to be introduced. Um, you know, the the cynics say that um, the only thing that is similar today to that in ancient Rome is the schools and that everything else is in fact, has shown these remarkable changes that we know sitting here on our Zoom call. Um, and uh, it's been slow, but at mm -hmm. the same time, what we know is if you do a lot of in-home instruction parents are sitting there watching what's going on. And some parents are pretty shocked that in my neighborhood are pretty shocked with the level of instruction that their kids are getting once they see it upfront and regularly in, uh, in their homes. So there's an outside chance, I would say, that we could in fact end up with a better schooling system. And that's something that you and I have been discussing for a long period of time. The, the way that we're going to meet the sustainable development goals of the United Nations is by improving the education. There's no other way to meet the very laudatory goals of the United Nations to end poverty and, and improve health and improve the environment. There's no way we can do that without growing the economies of the world. And the only way to grow the economies of the world is through education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question from Herminio Correa. Um, is there any real possibility to recover from those learning losses? I mean, is this, you know, an abstract, uh, is that something that is achievable in normal education systems? Um, well, I think it is. We have some examples. Um, we have examples like uh, um, Chile and Peru that improved uh, dramatically uh, over the uh, last two decades in, in their overall performance. We have other countries of the world that have also improved. Um, and so it's possible for entire school systems to improve. And we know that it's possible at the sort of micro level, at the district level, that some districts in every country of the world, you can point to a few districts that one way or another have figured out how to make their schools better. So it's not impossible. It, it's a bit of a struggle because we have a lot of inertia in the way we run our schools and we don't take advantage of what we've learned about running schools more effectively. Yeah, you know, and I would just like to emphasize this. I think, you know, if I look at the results from PISA over the last uh, 15, 20 years, we do see a fair number of countries at different levels of the initial development that have seen remarkable uh, levels of improvement, uh, remarkable levels also in uh, leveling the playing field, getting sort of a more equitable distribution of learning outcomes. Yeah, it is possible. And uh, surprisingly, it doesn't actually depend that much on uh, financial resources invested. Now, I think product, it's really about uh, productivity and not about more of the same in many, many places. So I think that's the encouraging part. Um, I, there's a question here. Um, uh, is the what about, about the likelihood that we were, may never return to fully in class learning? And uh, is that something that you had thought about? You know what, how that could impact on learning outcomes? Well, well, right now, all the evidence I see suggests that if we don't return to um, 
more of, of school-based learning, we're going to be in trouble in, in all the countries of the world. Um, that it's possible to use various uh, computerized internet uh, forms, at least in the countries that have broadband everywhere and have lots of iPads and so forth. But it turns out that that's not sufficient. That there are some people that can learn well on their own, but most people need somebody there, a teacher, a trained person to help them in their learning. That's what school is all about. And we have, we might be able to find ways to do that in a decentralized uh, uh, manner with in-home instruction, but we certainly haven't done it yet. Um, and there are, there are a few examples, of course, where it is being done very effectively um, in the US and elsewhere where they've worked a lot at digital technologies and so forth. But everywhere we know that the quality of the teachers and the quality of the schools is extraordinarily important. So it will take some big changes if we, know, if we don't go back to a lot of in-class instruction or personal instruction for, with the teachers, the trained people. Yeah, you know, again, you know, I can, from our own analysis, only reinforce this. Education is never just a simple transactional process. It's always a relational process. Right? And this kind of quality of teacher factor is just very, very significant. And the technology can probably amplify and accelerate it, but not replace it. And I think this is something that uh, I think this pandemic also has shown uh, quite clearly. Uh, there were a couple of questions about, you know, can we actually quantify the learning losses during school closures? And uh, uh, probably we can only guess at this point, you know, how much of that, uh, the alternative arrangements that have been put in place, you know, remote learning, online learning, how much learning has been achieved through this, but it's certainly going to be just a fraction of what have happened in normal schooling time. No? Well, we're starting to get a little of evidence on that score, but I think that all the evidence suggests that there were really on average significant learning losses. And as you pointed out, they're very skewed learning losses so that um, the losses were much greater in the places where they, <laughs> learning is most needed um, for disadvantaged kids. I think we're out of time, but I have one more question for you myself, uh, Rick, and that is how do we get this very important message across uh, to policymakers, you know, who have to, make to, have to make difficult decisions of, you know, trading in health related issues, pursuing learning issues and so on. But I, uh, how do we create the level of awareness that is needed for the consequences of uh, loss of learning? Well, we have, you know, all of the participants in this webinar, and I have to go out and uh, be involved and the parents have to be involved. And I think parents are starting to recognize that this is a serious matter for their kids that it takes a lot of work, but it's a slow process to um, get, particularly the media in, in the US, the media, is completely unconcerned about this issue at this point. Um, now, whether they stop running the constant stories about uh, the shortages of iPads in the homes and, and look for another story, we might hope that they in fact get to this issue of it's all about learning. It's not about the, the logistics and the, and the processes, it's about learning. And that's what we have to focus on completely. Thank you, Rick, uh, for the very important work that you're doing and also for sharing the results with us so generously. And with that, I pass the floor back to Susan. Thank, Thank you. you.
Huh? Thank you so much um, to Eric and to Andreas for a very stimulating beginning. Um, and so now we're able to move to the second portion of our webinar, where we are going to focus on the question of the evaluation of learning um, and what that means. My name is Lynn Goodwin, and I am Dean um, of the Faculty or School of Education um, at the University of Hong Kong, and also um, a member of the steering committee for the Forum for World Education. Our guest today is Dr. Randy Bennett, and I'm very pleased to welcome him. Um, he is also a member of our, uh, the planning committee for um, FWE and an expert um, in evaluation and assessment. So let me tell you a little bit about him if you don't know of him already. Dr. Bennett is a graduate of Teachers College Columbia University, and he is currently the Norman O. Fredrickson Chair in Assessment Innovation in the Research and Development Division at ETS, Educational Testing Service, which is in Princeton, um, New Jersey. Um, Dr. Bennett's work has focused on integrating advances in cognitive science, technology, and educational measurement to create approaches to assessment that have positive impact on teaching and learning. He's had a very long and illustrious career, and it's this, this is just really the very beginning, the tip of the many things that he has done. From 1999 through 2005, he directed the National Assessment of Educational Pro Progress, NAEP, technology-based assessment project, which included the first administration of computer-based performance assessments to nationally representative samples of school students, and the first use of log file data in such samples to measure the processes used in problem solving. From 2007 to, two, uh, to 2016, he directed an integrated research initiative titled, and I'm gonna read this, Cognitively Based Assessment of, For, and As Learning, also known as CBAL. This very extensive study focused on creating theory-based summative and formative assessment intended to model good teaching and learning practice. Dr. Randy Bennett is past president of the International Association for Educational Assessment. Many of you might know the initials IAEA, an organization uh, that is international and global, primarily constituted of governmental and non-governmental nonprofit measurement organizations throughout the world. Um, I happen actually to be a new representative for Hong Kong U um, in that organization. And so I'm learning um, very rapidly um, how extensive the reach of the organization is and the depth of its work. Um, Dr. Bennett is also a past president of NCME, the National Council on Measurement and Education. And uh, the members of NCME are individuals employed primarily in universities, testing organizations, state education departments, and school districts. He has many honors, um, of the holder of many honors. He is a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, AERA, and the winner of the NCME Bradley Hansen Contributions to Educational Measurement Award. He has received the Distinguished Alumni Award from Teachers College, Clem University, and is the recent 2020 recipient of the AERA EF Linguist Award for outstanding applied or theoretical research in the field of testing and, and measurement. And this award is given not for a piece of work, um, but for a body of work, which gives you a sense of the extent of his, um, uh, the work that he's done, the, the, the corpus of his work and the impact of his research. So uh, Randy, it's really lovely to have you here today. And what we thought would be a good idea was for, um, for us to just kind of have a chat about evaluation of learning. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna ask a few questions. I'm gonna keep an eye on the Q and A um, column as well. And what we hope to do is to talk a bit and then look and, and try and answer some questions and sort of move back and forth um, in that way. We know that uh, our time is brief and so we probably won't be able to get to everything, but we will do the best we can and move forward. So Randy, um, I think that there's, so, there's been so much discussion about assessment, so much concern about how to sort of do assessment in these very different um, and sort of evolving times. 
And there seems to be an awful lot of confusion about, there always is a lot of confusion about assessment. There's assessment, there's evaluation, there's testing. They're all different kinds of ways to evaluate learning. Can you kind of give us a brief sort of, um, um, you know, prima version of um, evaluation? Um, how should we think about it? What's important to know? Uh, what should we keep in mind when we sort of listen to these conversations about um, evaluation assessment of learning? And first, let me thank you for that very kind introduction and thank the Forum for World Education for providing us this opportunity to have this discussion. Uh, to answer your question, I'll first say that uh, the terms assessment and evaluation are in some places used interchangeably, in some places they use differently. Uh, for purposes of this discussion, uh, I'll focus on the term assessment and uh, as the larger overarching term and think of evaluation as a particular uh, application of assessment. So first, let me talk a bit about uh, how I define assessment and think about it. And I'll take a little bit of time to do that because that background will help in understanding what's it's most important to know about assessment. Uh, I think of assessment as a type of inquiry used to inform decision-making, usually about individuals, groups, or institutions, or it could be about a program that involves four fundamental acts. So first, engineering opportunities to observe evidence of the competencies we care about. Second, connecting the evidence we observe to inferences or judgments about those competencies. Third, communicating or otherwise using those inferences for decision-making. And finally, evaluating the quality and impact of the opportunities, evidence, inferences, and decisions. These four fundamental acts can be carried out for many different purposes, and they can take many different forms. Different implementations of those acts are what I would call assessment methods. So a standardized test done for say school accountability is a particular implementation or method of assessment. A classroom formative assessment done to help plan and adjust instruction is a different implementation of the same four fundamental acts. Both formative assessment and the standardized accountability test engineer evidence oppor gathering opportunities, but they but of different kinds. So the evidence gathering opportunities of the standardized test might be multiple choice questions. They might be constructed response questions. They might include an essay task. The evidence gathering opportunities of the formative assessment might include the teacher asking probing questions of an individual student, listening to the answers and asking further follow-up questions. Both the formative assessment and the standardized accountability test gather evidence, but of different kinds. The evidence coming from the standardized assessment, the standardized test, would be the responses that the student selects for the multiple choice questions. The words or phrases he or she inserts in response to the constructed response, the essay that is written. The evidence gathered by the teacher in formative assessment are, are the answers the student would give in that dialogue. Both types of assessment method, the formative assessment and the standardized test facilitate inferences, but again, of different kinds. The standardized accountability test about the extent to which students have mastered curriculum standards very broadly and the formative assessment, what a particular student or perhaps the class, if it's a class discussion, might understand about a single concept. Both of those methods are tuned to facilitating different kinds of decisions. The standardized assessment, uh, the standardized accountability test, uh, perhaps a decision about which schools to target for technical assistance by the state. The formative assessment, the decision about what to teach next. And finally, both of those methods are evaluated in very different ways. The standardized test through usually an extensive series of statistical and other types of analysis and the formative assessment more through the teacher's self-reflection about how effectively those, that questioning that the teacher did generated 
uh, evidence of use in, uh, in uh, making the decisions she or he had to make. So with that as introduction, let me say a bit about what I think it's important for us to know about assessment. First, all assessment methods have advantages and limitations. One such limitation is that all methods require that we make inferences about what students know and can do. We can't see inside a student's head. We can only make judgments or inferences in response to wh how, what it is we see uh, or hear uh, students do, regardless of the method that is used. Another limitation is that all methods have sociocultural influences, bring sociocultural influences with them. Standardized tests bring the sociocultural influences of those who create, score, and interpret the results, as well as the sociocultural perspectives inherent in the tools and the knowledge representations that are used in a given test, which may or may not align with the sociocultural background of all of the students taking that test. When misalignment occurs, we have several options. One is to change the test by engineering opportunities that are more aligned with the sociocultural background of the students. A second option is to change the students by familiarizing them with the sociocultural representations that are contained in the test. And a third option is to change the interpretation of test results for the individuals or groups for which the misalignment exists. And in some cases, we might do all three. Note that formative assessments, as well as grades, are not immune from sociocultural influences. Formative assessments and grades are given through the sociocultural lens of the teacher, which may or may not fit the sociocultural backgrounds of all of the students that that teacher works with. A third critically important limitation is that all methods of assessment are susceptible to issues of opportunity to learn or OTL, which I'll use for short. In the best case, a standardized test is a measure of what a student has learned given the opportunities he or she has had to learn. So in the best case, a test score reflects the interaction of opportunities given with what the student has done with those opportunities. Grades may on average be somewhat less susceptible to OTL because the person giving the grade may try to bring into the process consideration of what they per perceive as having been taught and what they perceive as having been the history of OTL for the students they're teaching. So taking all of that into account, taking the limitations I've described into account. The second thing that's important to know is that an assessment result shouldn't be taken as a generalized characteristic of a person, a group or institution, but rather might be better thought of as, for example, in the case of a test score, an estimate of the likelihood of the student to behave in certain ways under certain conditions. For example, in NAEP writing assessments, eighth grade students typically score higher than boys. Eighth grade girls typically score higher than boys. Rather than concluding that girls generally write better than boys, my interpretation would be much more conditionalized. That is that eighth grade girls tend to compose better than boys in an online, on-demand, timed setting when responding to prompts asking them to persuade, explain, or convey experience. That's a lot of conditions, but that interpretation sticks much closer to the facts than did the simpler claim that girls generally write better than boys. The larger point is that we, when we condition our inferences, we can more frequently avoid many of the issues that are brought to bear uh, when we try to interpret a test score or any assessment result as a generalized judgment. So Randy, you said so much in, in a few minutes that I have to unpack it a little bit. Um, let me start, you know, just sort of thinking about the, the situation that we're in now. Um, 
uh, we've, we've just had um, a, a, a very thoughtful conversation um, about learning losses. Um, and of course, assessments are involved in deciding, you know, what learning has been lost. Um, and um, there have been questions in the chat box about, will we ever get back to face-to-face? -to -face? Um, is face-to-face -face really better than online? Um, you know, how, how should we move forward thinking about learning? So going back to the three factors um, that you talked about in terms of assessment, um, you can change the test, you can change the student, or you can change inferences. Um, um, if you think about those three actions um, in the context of COVID-19, the pandemic that we're going through, what are some ways in which those three actions can help us think differently? about evaluation of learning? Well, certainly we wanna be thinking about uh, adjusting our inferences to the kinds of data that we uh, can collect. So uh, keep in mind that in the instance of uh, COVID-19, uh, we measure only certain things, and this is true, uh, uh, routinely. Uh, there are certain things that uh, we've decided to measure uh, because uh, they are both valued and uh, we have limited resources and time to do the kinds of measurements that we do. So typically we're measuring uh, English language arts in the United States, uh, mathematics, and in some grade science in our school accountability assessment programs. And even in the measures that we administer in those areas, we're measuring a subset of uh, the curriculum standards typically, and we're not measuring all standards with equal precision. So uh, we don't know what we haven't measured, number one. Uh, we don't know uh, how students uh, grew or lost in the subject areas we didn't measure. Uh, we don't know how students uh, grew or lost in those portions of the subject areas we did measure, but this didn't measure as well or didn't measure at all. So we have to certainly adjust our learning, uh, our inferences uh, for that fact. We also have to keep in mind that we didn't measure and typically don't measure uh, many non-cognitive factors that may also be important, uh, socio-emotional related factors that are important to learning. So adjusting inferences with respect to those, uh, we don't know uh, what the impact of COVID might have been on, on, on those. So those are uh, some things uh, we certainly uh, could do with respect to uh, how we infer. So I'm thinking about um, uh, the whole idea of teaching as sort of a, a social interaction. Um, and a lot of that social interaction um, has been uh, certainly minimized, changed, reduced um, as a result of the pandemic that we are undergoing. Um, but moving forward, um, chances are that we uh, are, are unlikely to go back to 100% face-to-face. And even if we do, the experience that we've been through is gonna change you know, what we do in classrooms. So I'm thinking about teachers um, and how you would talk to them about um, trying to gather information about some of these other non-cognitive um, factors um, that are equally important, but um, are not so easily measured and quite often depend on sort of observation and you know, classroom-based sorts of formative assessments. Um, how should they be thinking about that sort of pretty normal work that teachers do um, in the classroom moving forward or, or right now, never mind moving forward because everyone is is still engaged online, even in, if they're in a sort of hybrid mode? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, it's certainly going to be more difficult in an online environment to the extent uh, 
that the class is a the relatively large class. Uh, so as an example, I participate right now in an online learning experience uh, once a week uh, as a student. And there are six, maybe seven kids in the class, depending upon, and I say kids because they are kids, I'm the only adult. Uh, and uh, it's relatively easy for our teacher, who is really very good, uh, to constantly question us and observe our responses and do in the moment kinds of uh, formative assessments to make inferences based on the evidence we provide to her about what it is we know, about whether it is we're attending and focusing because she can see all of our faces on the screen. There's only six or seven of us. But imagine a class of 30 or maybe in, in other countries, in some other countries, larger. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that gets impossible to do. That kind of uh, in the moment formative assessment uh, becomes uh, very difficult. And uh, other kinds of approaches uh, uh, need to be used. Uh, for example, randomly calling upon students in a larger class to uh, give an answer to a question. Uh, asking students to, uh, before the class ends, uh, respond to a key question about what was being taught. Do that in the chat box so that the teacher can get some sense of uh, on the whole what it was that students got out of that lesson. So I think there are some things teachers can do, but I think they're going to be much more difficult to do. So it certainly has implications also for professional development and for teacher preparation. Um, as, as we've also been discussing um, to a great extent. Let me just turn now to um, a question in, uh, that has been posed by uh, Rajat Kawas, and, and, uh, or Kawas. And if I'm mispronouncing your name, please forgive me. So uh, the question is, assessments of learning outcomes in education and skills as competencies may be different. Evaluation is continuous and assessment is an event? Question mark, please clarify. What's your thought on that? Yeah, uh, in, in my experience, assessment and evaluation uh, are not, are used differently in different places. They're used by the same people to sometimes mean the same thing and sometimes mean different things. I have tended to use assessment as the larger overarching category and to think of evaluation more often uh, as a subset. Uh, for example, uh, program evaluation as a type of assessment, uh, as an assessment activity uh, focused on making judgments of the value of a particular set of educational activities, or teacher evaluation uh, being making judgments about the competency of an individual to teach. Uh, but as I say, uh, not everyone uses that terminology in the same way as I do. Some people use evaluation and assessment to mean the same thing. Some people use evaluation to mean what it is you do with the results of assessment and so on. So going back to um, the issue of sort of the, the social cultural um, aspects of assessment, um, and I'm actually going to pull back, um, go, go backward to, to a question that was asked um, during the previous um, discussion. And it says here um, uh, that the estimate of learning losses should take into account the impact of lower household incomes that affect learning, uh, lower budgets allocated to education because educational spending is different. Um, uh, uh, it's not just different across countries, but it's different across districts or neighborhoods or different kinds of schools. So the average and distributional effects might be larger. What kind of social contract uh, could channel the resources and gain the political support to overcome this sort of um, impact on learning? And does this, would assessment play a role 
in that social contract. Well, I added it, that part. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> it, it's an important question, and you know that's a big discussion. That's been that's a discussion that's been happening in the United States uh, since uh, the many issues that have occurred with making uh, citizens of the United States uh, more aware of the social injustices, the racial injustices in particular, that have characterized our society. And those uh, racial injustices have taken the form of what many have started to call uh, systematic racism or structural racism or structural inequity. And those structural inequities have for hundreds of years led to what I would argue, and I think many people would agree, differences in opportunity to learn. Differences in opportunity to learn that are a function of uh, racial, uh, ethnic, uh, socioeconomic uh, level. Uh, those differences in opportunity to learn are reflected in educational assessments, in the performance of students, in the scores that students receive. Uh, educational assessments, standardized tests in particular, are very sensitive to those differences in opportunity to learn. And in that sense, they're very valuable as indicators of the opportunities to learn that students have had and what it is they, they have been able to do with those opportunities. And indeed, uh, many civil rights groups in the United States have been supportive of state accountability testing for that very reason. For the reason that those tests have been able to shine the light on these differences in opportunity as a function and the success of individual schools in overcoming those differences in opportunity uh, so that resources can be targeted to uh, the education of the groups who have had less opportunity and so that the schools that are not succeeding in providing those opportunities uh, to students of uh, uh, disadvantage and to students of uh, groups that have been traditionally underrepresented, re underrepresented uh, so that they can be more effectively served. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm curious um, what you think about, uh, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can phrase this properly, learning loss that we've been discussing um, in relation to opportunities to learn. Um, do you think that um, the, the data that we're seeing um, really sort of uh, highlight what has always been in place, that opportunities to learn have been um, less present um, for certain groups versus others? And now um, the pandemic, um, which has shone the light on inequity and gaps, um, is shining the light on that as well. Um, that those learning losses, um, I'm not suggesting that they wouldn't have been there, um, but, and, and certainly they have been exacerbated, but they've kind of been there all along. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Uh, you know, think about what uh, COVID has done. It's disrupted opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. disrupted opportunity to learn differentially, I believe, uh, depending upon uh, demographic group. Uh, so for example, if you're a member of uh, a high SES uh, demographic group, uh, your chances of having your parents hire somebody to tutor you, uh, uh, it could be online tutoring, it could be uh, a tutor coming uh, to your home, and I know of some parents that have done that, are greater than if you're from a low SES environment. If you're from a low SES environment, your chances of having an educated, highly educated parent at home to help you while you are doing your online learning or to supplement your online learning are much lower than if you're from a higher SES group. If you're a student with disabilities, your chances of having effective 
uh, services from your school are much lower. Uh, you can't do physical therapy very effectively online. You can't do it remotely. Occupational therapy is very hard to do online. So what COVID has done, I think, is disrupted opportunity to learn further. It's, mm. I think, furthered uh, the gap in opportunity to learn uh, between those who are more fortunate than those who are less fortunate, if we want to characterize it that way. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, colleagues of mine um, at the University of Hong Kong in the Faculty of Ed just recently did a survey of principals, parents, secondary school students, teachers, et cetera, um, about, um, you know, sort of uh, the, the digital divide. Um, and um, what they discovered was uh, that for certain groups of students, the more advantaged uh, students, they were actually learning gains, that they actually moved further ahead than they might have otherwise. Um, uh, and there were, of course, learning losses or learning gaps um, for other students who, um, you know, were less privileged, uh, came from um, uh, schools that were less, you know, poorly resourced, um, et cetera. So if, if you think about this idea of um, learning gains um, or learnings that are not so easily measured, and I'm going to connect this to a question asked by David Watt. Um, he asks, under pandemic, how will we assess and evaluate better health and well-being, especially social and emotional learning? Um, so thinking about ways in which students might have gained in terms of independence or resilience or um, self-regulation um, during uh, the pandemic. Um, those are things that we that are that are invisible um, in some sense, even though uh, many teachers report that or parents are talking about it. I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think in the best of all possible worlds, uh, if we can do uh, evaluations, assessments of students in standardized and non-standardized ways, uh, using mixed methods approaches, so that we gather both quantitative and qualitative data, uh, we, we might be able to assemble uh, a more meaningful picture of what it is that they have gained or lost. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I fear that, uh, like uh, Professor Hanyashek, that uh, it's going to be more on the lost side uh, for most students, at least uh, for the most vulnerable students, uh, almost certainly. Uh, so, uh, Mixed methods, I think, uh, are very important because that's the only way we're going to be able to get a more complete picture. Uh, simply using one approach uh, will give us a slice, insight into a slice of what it is uh, that students may have uh, lost or gained. Uh, in addition to that, I think we'll, we'll need to be very careful about how we go about interpretation trying to use the data coming from uh, both types of methods to triangulate uh, to the extent possible the interpretations that we make. Hmm. That's gonna be a hard one. Yeah, uh, I think it's gonna be very important to gather data about the learning context and uh, what it is that students have learned. Uh, so if you look at OECD, for example, in addition to PISA, OECD routinely uses dozens of indicators to describe and contextualize learning. And I think we need to be doing the same thing with respect to trying to understand COVID learning gains and losses. So in addition to achievement measures and non-cognitive measures, if we can uh, manage to administer them, uh, we should be trying to find out things like how instruction was delivered. Was it done in person? Was it done remotely? Was it a combination of both? How many contact hours of each type were there? What were the absentee rates for remote instruction? What kind of technology access was there? What was the nature of the home environment uh, in which learning was delivered? Uh, that is, was the student uh, engaging in online learning in the kitchen while uh, 
uh, someone was cooking and while there were kids uh, playing and uh, uh, all of the disruptions were happening or was the student uh, by his or herself in a quiet uh, portion of the house? Who else was present when the student was, lear was learning? Was there an adult? Was an adult there to help uh, manage issues with technology, to help uh, keep the student focused? Uh, what type is it of instruction uh, was delivered? Was it synchronous with the teacher or was it asynchronous? I know of many instances in which uh, students are being given assignments and there is mm. no content with uh, the, the teacher at, at all. And what was the content of that instruction? And finally, what are the demographic characteristics of the students and how does all of this uh, fit together? So I think there's a lot of context we need in addition to simply knowing what students gained or lost. That is a great list of sort of factors or questions to ask. Um, I'm glad we're recording this because that's something that can go on our website because I think those would be really, really helpful on um, a very local level, um, uh, you know, uh, amongst a group of teachers or on a more, you know, sort of uh, systems level or systemic level um, in a district. Um, so I'm aware of the time. So let me ask the, 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 the last question, which is kind of the big one. Um, how do you think assessment is likely to change um, over the next 10 years? And, you know, obviously it's gonna, it changes all the time and it's gonna change as a result of COVID, but there are lots of other things happening as well as we learn more. Um, about learning? Well, I have a, I have a very long list. Uh, so, you know, I'll go through uh, as much of that uh, as you like. And uh, I also have an article about this very topic. So if uh, individuals would like uh, to uh, be directed to that article, they can just uh, say so in the chat and uh, uh, we can do that uh, from the website. We can uh, post it on website. the website. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So let me start with uh, what I think won't change. Uh, mm. because I think what won't change uh, may be as important as what will change. Mm. So what won't change, I, I, I think, are the four fundamental acts that uh, I use to define assessment. I think those are defined at a high enough level or stated at a high enough level that they will remain uh, persistent. A second thing that won't change, I think, are the social problems that drive the purposes for assessment. We do assessment for important social reasons, that is to address important social problems, documenting the effectiveness of education, monitoring opportunity gaps and group achievement differences, informing resource allocation decisions to individuals such as uh, whom to admit to highly selective institutions and helping to improve teaching and learning. Those social problems have been with us for decades and mm -hmm. none of them are going away anytime yeah. soon. Mm -hmm. The third thing that won't change are the scientific and social values that underlie assessment. And I would summarize those scientific and social values as meaningfulness, fairness, and reproducibility. They're all key values. And finally, what I don't think will go away is the need for dedicated methods of assessment that are fit for purpose, fit for particular purposes. One method won't be able to serve multiple purposes optimally. For example, a formative assessment incidentally generating the information needed for school accountability. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that optimizing effectiveness for one purpose by definition necessarily results in reducing the effectiveness for other purposes. So that said, I think there are gonna be a lot of very significant changes. And those significant changes I think will occur primarily in the methods that we use and how, we, uh, how those methods play out and in some of the targets for assessment. So uh, some of these changes are gonna be very obvious because they're already occurring. And one change that's already occurring is that the assessments are becoming more and more technology-based and mm -hmm. that better fits with a remote learning. Uh, future. So uh, the U.S. National Assessment of Educational Progress, PISA, many U.S. state assessments like the ones done in California and throughout the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, uh, the GRE General Test, the Test of English as a Foreign Language, the Pearson Test of English, Duolingo English Tests, uh, all of those tests 
are, uh, are, are administered uh, through technology. They're all administered online. And more of them are being remotely administered to individuals at home. That's already occurring with the GRE general test, the TOEFL, and a bunch of others. Uh, a second change, I think, will be measuring so-called new constructs to broaden assessment and learning targets beyond the traditional literacy-related and quantitative ones, and beyond the usual cognitive ones. So things like socio-emotional learning, collaboration, teamwork, and the like, things like the processes students use in problem solving. A third change I think is that assessments of the future will be built from richer underlying models of learning and cognition to account for theoretical advances that uh, I don't think are very well reflected in today's traditional assessment approaches, in particular state accountability assessments, which tend to be grounded in uh, uh, outdated uh, learning theory. Uh, an example would be an example of the kind of richer underlying model would be the use of learning progressions to model common pathways to the, to the development of key competencies or concepts, or the use of sociocognitive and sociocultural models of learning that lead to more conditional interpretations of performance, as I gave before in the example of NAEP. Mm -hmm. The fourth uh, change, I think, will be greater use of more complex tasks because proficiency in a domain usually entails being able to engage in an extended performance in that domain, uh, such as creating and uh, making uh, a convincing argument for purposes uh, of uh, persuasion. Performances call for integration of component skills uh, that selected response tests uh, tend to measure, that is the, the components as opposed to the integration. And it's been true for quite some time that some uh, assessments have tried to use those performances uh, as a routine part, but it has been hardly uh, the, uh, the typical case. Uh, NAEP and the Advanced Placement Program of the College Board are examples that have tried to use performances uh, very uh, typically. Mm -hmm. A fifth uh, characteristic of assessments of the future is that I think to be more personalized, to recognize that everybody is not the same. So many assessments today adapt according uh, to uh, the skill level of the examinee. So as the student is taking the test, the test will get harder or easier depending upon uh, what uh, the test perceives as that, as that examinee's skill level. Tests of the future may adapt more to interests and uh, the particular content uh, that uh, a student might be more or less uh, interested in and may in the future uh, adapt to education goal. And there are some examples of assessments that do that in uh, simpler ways right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Tests of the future, I think, will attempt to improve learning, not just measure it. Uh, so assessment should be, in my view, a learning experience. A student should gain something from taking an assessment, uh, not just be measured by it. And uh, we can take as a small example the idea of writing from sources, which is done in many English language arts assessments today. And those sources and the topic that the student is being asked to write about ought to be chosen with an eye toward engendering learning about something important, like for example, environmental protection. Mm -hmm. uh, a second example might be including criteria for what constitutes good performance as part of the assessment. So when asking a student to write an argumentative essay, give the student a set of criteria for what constitutes a good argumentative essay. And by doing so, put in front of the student and in front of the teacher, criteria that can be used in teaching and criteria that can be internalized by the student for purposes of evaluating his or her own performance. Seventh, I would suggest that assessments of the future will be better at accounting for context because learners come from a variety of socio-cultural backgrounds. And I think the most important thing to remember with respect to context and sociocultural background is that 
how a student performs on a test is a fact. The score the student gets is a fact. Why the student performed that way is a matter of interpretation. And that interpretation requires knowledge of sociocultural context and background. Eighth, I think assessments are more likely to be embedded and distributed over time in the future to bring assessment closer to the times when information could be of most use uh, to teachers and uh, students. Ninth, I think assessments will be more likely to use artificial intelligence methods of scoring performance tasks so that more performance tasks can be used and feedback can be made faster and cheaper. But note that with that, comes the potential dangers of artificial intelligence. So for example, if we model our artificial intelligence on human grade, grading, we will be likely to bring with it the biases that uh, humans uh, bring to that grading. That is the AI programs will inherit the human biases. Uh, second important thing to understand about AI is that at present, it doesn't understand what it grades. It only predicts what a human would be likely to give. So we have to keep those caveats in mind when using those kinds of approaches. Tenth and penultimately, uh, I think assessments of the future will incorporate new approaches to modeling and analysis to handle the new types of tasks and data like process data that are becoming available. And this is that second fundamental act. How do you connect what it is you observe to the inferences that you want to make? Statistical tools can be very helpful in mm. that respect and new advances are occurring all the time. And finally, new approaches to reporting. I think reporting is has to become more effective uh, to increase the likelihood and value of information use. Uh, the ways that we report results today uh, are in many cases very limited. PISA does an unusually good job, but PISA is more the exception uh, than the rule. Uh, I think uh, reporting is something that uh, we have not studied enough and we have not uh, utilized enough in ways that create value for students, teachers, and policymakers and the public. So I'll stop there. Well, it, you are perfectly on time. It is 11, well, actually now 11.01. So we've done really wow. well. That was an amazing, fascinating list. Um, and all I could think about was just sort of um, the interesting, rich work that needs to be done um, that will engage many people in sort of really deep, um, and complex sort of study and research um, around those 10 points. Um, in closing, I'm just going to first thank you um, for a, a, just an enlightening discussion. I've learned so much and I'm sure everyone in the audience would agree with me. Um, out of your 10 points, I think the one that I love the most is that testing should be a learning experience. Mm -hmm. That it actually, it should not simply be sort of students um, uh, demonstrating performing, um, but that it actually is something that benefits them. So um, to everyone in our audience, thank you so much for, for being with us this evening. If you like this discussion, we are actually going to continue um, in January. Our next webinar will be in January. And we're actually gonna talk about the science of learning and it connects really well with what Randy has been talking about in terms of the underlying models of learning and cognition. Um, that need to be different and better. Um, and uh, uh, as we think about assessments uh, going forward, um, COVID and beyond. So last word for us, Randy, before we uh, close. Take a thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, FWE and uh, all of our attendees. It's been a pleasure. It's been great. Uh, have a good evening or good day, everyone. January, um, the next webinar for FWE. Hope to see you then. Thanks everyone. Bye.